Okay, let's get started. Um, today we're going to be focusing on the problem of medical harm or iatrogenesis, which means doctor caused injur injury. And we're going to be considering how extensive is this problem, what might be done about it, and how are patients and physicians affected by it. And um, I assigned for you to read a really powerful critique, right? I mean, Ivan Illich is, is, um, is strident in his critique. And Illich, you probably don't know, uh, was a sort of Marxist uh, Catholic, Catholic friar who um, was uh, very concerned with the problems of modernity. And he wrote a bunch of critiques of uh, schooling, and he wrote a famous book called De-Schooling Society, and he wrote a critique of modern transportation systems, and he also wrote a critique of modern healthcare systems, which he thought were not so good. And uh, I'll just read to you the opening of, the, of, of what I assigned to you, which is well worth reading. This is Illich. Illich says, this is the first sentence of his book, he says, the medical establishment has become a major threat to health. The disabling impact of professional control over medicine has reached the proportions of an epidemic. Iatrogenesis, the name for this new epidemic, comes from yatros, the Greek word for physician, and genesis, meaning origin. Discussions of the disease of medical progress has moved up on the agendas of medical conferences. Researchers concentrate on the sick-making powers of diagnosis and therapy and reports on paradoxical damage caused by cures for sickness take up increasing space in medical dope sheets. I mean, Illich is not happy with modern medicine. He's very concerned about the damage that modern medicine might do. And in fact, when I was in training, one of my residents took me aside sometime during my internship and told me something I've not forgotten. He said to me, Remember, Nicholas, hospital admission is not a benign procedure. Bad things can happen to people under medical care, and we need to take this possibility very seriously. Now, there are many different terms that can be used to describe medical harm. Uh, an error or a mistake is a failure of the planned action to be completed or the use of a wrong plan. An adverse event is an injury resulting from a medical intervention rather than the disease itself, and it typically involves an error. But an adverse reaction is a bad outcome from a well-planned action. And not all errors lead to harm. And not all harms are the result of errors. There can also be something known as malocurrence. Something bad happened, but it wasn't anyone's fault. And not all errors are negligent because negligence is judged according to local standards. It is care, negligence is care falling below the standard of care in the community. So just because in the hands of the world's best surgeon, a bad outcome would not have occurred, does not mean a doctor whose care results in a bad outcome has been negligent. And finally, there's also the problem of poor quality care which subsumes all of the foregoing and more. Illich and others lump all of these under the term of iatrogenesis or doctor caused injury. And this term and medical harm, the term medical harm are the most general terms we could use. Now here's one way to group these kinds of events. You imagine that there's some medical error, I'm sorry, some medical intervention, there's no error but, and then there's a good outcome, okay, great. Or there could be a bad outcome, that's an adverse reaction. Or there was a mistake, but it was inconsequential, so there's still a good outcome. Or there could be something significant about the error, uh, which is a potential adverse event, which still might be, you know, you might save the patient from the problem, so you have a good outcome, or there's a bad outcome, in which case it would be seen as a preventable adverse event. And in many situations, you can have a kind of fulminating combination of all of these factors with error upon error, malpractice upon malocurrence, and harm upon harm. 
In fact, doctors do countless things that they may think are helpful, but that actually are not. Exposing patients to risk of harm and expense without the prospect of benefit. And we saw some examples of this a few lectures ago with respect to the technology used during labor. But consider another example. This is a procedure known as percutaneous vertebraloplasty, which involves the injection of medical cement into a fractured vertebral body. So here there's a fracture, you, you, you inject the patient with cement into the, into the bone to kind of, uh, to stabilize it. Uh, and, it's, and this fracture is typically painful and often arises because of osteoporosis. So it's not crazy to think, well, maybe if I put some cement in that porous bone, it will stabilize that bone and I'll, I'll help the patient. And it gained, this practice gained widespread acceptance as an effective method of pain relief and became routine therapy for osteoporotic, that's like bone loss, osteoporosis in elderly people, osteoporotic, it became the routine therapy for osteoporotic vertebral fractures. And finally, in 2009, a multicenter trial randomly assigned 131 patients to undergo either the surgery or a sham procedure, a simulated procedure without any cement. And this is ex an extremely rare example of a placebo-controlled surgical trial. It's very rare that we randomly assign, we say, pick patients in the operating room and say, you guys are gonna get a real operation and the rest of you are gonna get a fake operation because we wanna check whether the operation actually works. You might think, well, surgeons know what they're doing. It's very mechanical. They're cutting and moving things around. How could it, how could it help if it doesn't actually help? Well, sometimes just merely the experience of going to the operating room makes patients feel better. And sometimes it could be harming patients and we don't know. Anyway, in this study, the primary outcome was disability and pain and higher scores are worse. And at one month, there was no significant difference between the vertebraloplasty group and the control group, even though both groups had immediate improvement in pain and disability. So here is the surgical group. Here's the sham surgical group. They had similar levels of, uh, of uh, function and pain at the beginning. And at three days, everyone is better. Even the people that got the sham surgery feel much better after the surgery. But by the end, there's no difference between the groups. So that's really a death knell for the uh, performance of this surgery. And another similar RCT conducted around the same time of the same procedure came to a similar conclusion. And these two trials that were published in 2009 had a huge effect on medical practice. An estimated 81,000 patients underwent vertebral oplasty in the United States between 2006 and 2014. But after 2009, the cases progressively declined. And in fact, the number of procedures decreased 53% by two, uh, from, from, from over the course of a year or two after the study was published. And, uh, and the cost decreased 43% to $87 million. So we saved lots of surgeries and lots of money by, by doing this, but we're still doing a lot of these procedures and spending a lot of money, despite the fact that the trials have shown that they're not beneficial, probably because some surgeons believe they're still helpful. And they may be helpful under certain circumstances, but not in general. Now, the bad things that can happen to you while you're in the hospital or under medical care can run the gamut. This is an example of a rare and particularly nasty drug reaction called toxic epidermal necrolysis, or SJS, Stevens-Johnson syndrome. In it, your skin literally sloughs off your body. It's an immune complex mediated hypersensitivity disorder. You, your body mounts a, an immune attack on the medicine that you've been given. It can be caused by many drugs, but also by viral infections and malignancies. And actually when it's severe, it can even be fatal in three to 15% of cases. Now, whether you would judge this to merely be an adverse reaction or a negligent adverse event would depend, for example, on whether the patient survived and on whether the doctor should have known that the patient was allergic to the drug that they were given. If you innocently give the, patient, the, the drug to the patient, they get this condition and they survive, you think differently about it than if you goof and give a drug to a patient you know they were allergic to and then they die, very different situation. And adverse drug reactions, including severe ones like this, are not uncommon. 
Look at these awful blisters on the back of this guy's body. The skin is just coming off. And this is a paper that I was introduced to by an expert in the problem of medical harm, Lucien Leap, when I was a medical student in the 1980s. So almost 40 years ago, I read this paper and it made a huge impression on me and I still use it to teach. The title of this paper was Intratracheal Fire Ignited by a Neodymium YAG Laser During Treatment of Tracheal Stenosis. In other words, the trachea had become kind of occluded and they put a, a laser in a tube into the patient's throat to try to blast the, the blockage and they lit the patient on fire inside their body. And I, I thought to myself, oh my God, there's a fire inside the patient's lungs. You know, oxygen is flowing in there. And, and it made a huge impression on me that we could do such things to patients. And so in fact, being in a hospital is indeed not safe if we can get fires even in the inside of patients' bodies. This is another illustrative case. Man has wrong kidney removed, London, 2006. Medical officials said on Thursday that doctors at a Scottish hospital had removed the wrong kidney from a patient during an operation. John Heron, who media reports said was believed to be in his 60s, had the healthy organ taken out during surgery at Air Hospital. It is with deep regret that I confirm that a patient being cared for in the Air Hospital has had a healthy kidney removed, said Bob Masterton, executive director of the NHS Ayrshire and Aaron Trust. Our thoughts are with the patient and family to whom we apologize for this tragic error. Staff are supporting the patient and family in planning for the best possible medical care for Mr. Heron in the future. In a statement, Heron's family said they were devastated by, by the disastrous professional errors that should never have happened. And these cases are not unheard of. A study of 20 years worth of malpractice claims revealed the frequency of such never events between 1990 and 2020. So between in this 20 year period, there were roughly 5,000 reported cases in the United States of wrong site, wrong procedure and wrong person surgery. And uh, this is the total number of events. Uh, this is the me mean malpractice payment for these events. And I don't, I don't know why the payment for op operating on the wrong patient is less than doing the wrong procedure. <laughs> which you would think would be really a worse, considered a worse, a worse error. Wrong person mistakes, though very rare, can take amazing forms. Woman says she okayed life support termination for stranger. This just happened last year before I taught the class last year. A New York woman sat vigil for days at her dying brother's hospital bedside, authorized doctors to stop life support and was arranging his funeral when officials revealed it had all been a big mistake. The man wasn't her brother at all, but a stranger with a similar name. Cheryl Powell is suing a Bronx hospital over the case of mistaken identity, saying she and other relatives were put through more than a month of unnecessary grief. That is my baby brother, so it was really hurtful, Powell told the New York Post. I was worried, hurt, crying, screaming, calling everybody. It was a horrible feeling. Her actual brother, Frederick Williams, was alive, but unbeknownst to his family, was locked up in a city jail. St. Barnabas Hospital spokesman Steve Clark told the Post that the lawsuit was without merit. The mix-up began on July 15th, according to Powell's lawsuit, when Freddie Clarence Williams was admitted to the hospital unconscious with brain damage from a drug overdose. The family looked into its rec, I'm sorry, the hospital looked into its records saw that a Frederick Williams had been treated before and called his family, the suit said, but it was the wrong Fred Williams. Powell said that when she visited the man she thought was her brother, he had a tube in his mouth and a swollen appearance. Another sibling arrived and raised doubts about whether some error had been made. Now, it's not inconceivable that your relative who looks vaguely like the person is all swollen and you're told it's your relative you might say, well, this is 100% look like my brother, but you know, it probably is him. And off you go in this situation. But here's an interesting detail about the British case that I mentioned before from another newspaper. Man who had wrong kidney surgery 
removed breaks silence. John said he told doctors minutes before the operation that the pain was on the left side, not on the right. But they had already marked his body with a pen and dismissed his fears, even though they had not seen vital x-rays showing the tumor was on his left kidney. I can't tell you how often we were taught, listen to the patient and uh, how important it is to discipline yourself to do that. The guy says this before surgery, take a break, see what the hell is going on. Don't just operate because the body's been marked on that side. And in fact, the majority of these cases are indeed due to a breakdown in communication between the surgical team and the patient and family, according to the uh, a national organization that studied these things in the United States. Emergency procedures, unusual equipment, staff rotation, or time pressures are also frequent causes of these types of problems. Now the need for improved communication is stressed to patients to the extent of even highlighting their responsibility to communicate with their doctors so as to avoid medical mistakes. This is an old tip sheet from, the, from a US federal agency on ways to prevent medical errors. And it mentions the problem of right part surgery ways you can help your family prevent medical errors. Medical errors are mistakes that can happen with your healthcare. Medical errors can hurt or even kill people. The government, hospitals, doctors, and others are working hard to prevent medical care errors. This booklet has tips on what you can do to help, to help keep you and your family safe. These tips are based on studies by, medical, by many medical researchers. And the, and the tips in the pamphlet include the suggestion that you be an active member of your healthcare team. The effort involved to involve patients and it can actually go quite far. So here are 20 tips to prevent medical errors. And one of the passages here reads, medical errors can occur anywhere in the healthcare system, in hospitals, clinics, surgery centers, nursing homes, and so on. Errors can involve medicine, surgery, diagnosis, equipment, or lab reports. These tips tell you what you can do to get safer care. One in seven Medicare patients in hospitals experiences a medical error. I mean, just nonchalantly, one in seven experiences a medical error, but medical errors can occur anywhere in the healthcare system. Most errors result from problems created by today's complex healthcare system, but errors also happen when doctors and patients have problems communicating. These tips tell you what you can do to get safer care. So once again, a kind of uh, discussion with the patient about what they can do and uh, telling them that they should be an active member of their team. Now, let me see if I can get this to play and for you to hear it. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. I hope you will. Uh, uh, Maggie, could you ping me if they can't hear it? Here yes, certainly. All right, here we go. Any questions? No. You know, we're not magicians, we can't read your mind. We get your questions, each and every kind. How many times have you done this before? Now, I, I, I definitely want you to internalize a lesson that questions are important, okay? So you absolutely should ask your doctor questions and you should not be intimidated and you should advocate for yourself. But having said that, what strikes you about this video? Who wants to make a comment about this video? Ananya. Um, I think the emphasis seems to be on getting the patients to act better and like kind of implies that like, oh, if patients advocate for themselves, then nothing will happen. And like taking 
kind of shifting the responsibility off from the doctors and onto the patient. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what's going on. And it's actually quite troubling. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Kenneth. I, I think also if we connect this to one of the themes in the course, it's a very um, individualized view of what, you know, individual uh, medical cases, uh, how individual medical cases can improve and it doesn't speak to any sort of structural changes in the healthcare system or what hospitals can do. Excellent. Emphasis on agency away from structure. Chris. Um, I think I definitely agree with the other people said. I think one of the concerns that I thought of was um, I feel like like I wouldn't know what questions to ask in a lot of situations. Um, like I think there's that saying that's like you don't know what you don't know. So like if I'm not like prompted to like um, I don't know, be asked something, I wouldn't know what it is. Um, I wouldn't know like what's the right question to ask regarding like these specific types of care. Yes, that's right. It shifts, in a way, it shifts the responsibility to the actor. On the one hand, the patient has the most motivation to get things right. But in principle, the patient has the least knowledge about what is the you know, proper medical uh, deployment. So all of those are good observations, exactly right. Uh, shift in, it's important to have an active role if you're a patient, but if there's a shift in the responsibility, maybe too much, the balance between the institution and the individual. And the difference, another point, is the difference between patient rights and patient responsibilities. Now, the problem of medical harm can get actually still worse. These are four healthcare workers who probably none of you would recognize any of them. Here on the far left is Charles Cullen, a nurse who was admitted to, ki who admitted to killing at least 29 patients in 2006. Next up is Dr. Michael Swango. He killed between 35 and 60 patients in numerous hospitals around the United States between 1984 and 2000. Next is Dr. Harold Shipman. He had 250 probable victims in England between, between 1970 and 1998. And finally is Niels Hogel, a German nurse who admitted to killing over 100 patients and maybe 200 at two hospitals between 2000 and 2005 in just five years. Hogel gave his victims various non-prescribed drugs in an attempt to show off his resuscitation skills to colleagues and to fight off boredom. Indeed, some of the most prolific serial killers have been doctors and nurses. This is if you look at league tables of serial killers, like the top 10 serial killers in the world ever, like half of them are doctors and nurses. For a number of reasons, they have easy access to victims and importantly and grossly, they don't have any need to dispose of the body because a patient dying in a hospital, there are automatic procedures for taking care of people's bodies. And often in these cases, in all of these four cases and others like them, there's been complicity of the hospital bu bureaucracy. That is, there is a sense in which this phenomenon is an illustration of a broader kind as social iatrogenesis that I will return to in a moment. There is some sense in these cases that the healthcare system can be seen as responsible for them, at least in part, namely that in both the Shipman and in the Swango cases and in others like it, subsequent inquiries revealed that the medical establishment, principally through apathy, actually protected the murdering doctors, turning a blind eye to their activities. For example, colleagues of Dr. Swango called him double O Swango. Like they all knew this guy was bad news, but nothing was done. Licensing boards and other authorities typically refuse to revoke the ability of such doctors to practice, despite compelling early evidence that such doctors act in injurious fashion to their patients. And given the scattered way we have licensure in the United States, these doctors can just move from one state to another, one step ahead of their uh, pursuers. Now, these are all what I've given you so far as usual, you know, are all very dramatic examples. Uh, and most mistakes are much more mundane, involving the administration of the wrong drug or some human or mechanical error that is to a greater or lesser extent avoidable or unavoidable. One very comprehensive study in your readings looked closely using systematic assessment tools at the hospital charts of 795 patients in three hospitals. And it found that there were 393 adverse events, including eight deaths in the 795 patients. So some patients also experience more than one event. 
So this shows the type of adverse event in severity level. This is the most severe, it's death. This shows the total, and there are different kinds of medication-related, procedure-related, nosocomial infections, that's a hospital-acquired infection, dev device failure, and so on. And there are eight deaths among these 795 uh, patients. So 1% of the patients hospitalized died from a medical mistake or medical error. Stated another way, adverse events occurred in 33% of hospital admissions at a rate of 91 per 1,000 hospital days, and 1% of patients died. Now, incidentally, this study also found that one of the most widely used tools to detect iatrogenic, iatrogenesis and medical harm, in the opinion of this study, grossly underestimated the frequency of adverse events in hospitalized patients. Overall, mistakes, both minor and major, are not uncommon. And they occur across the whole spectrum of care, from diagnosis to treatment. And the burden of medical harm is very significant. Another study using a very broad sample found that adverse events occur in at least 3.7% of hospitalizations. 27% of these are due to negligence, and 13% of these events resulted in death, and 2.6% in serious disability. Actually, if you do this arithmetic, you find that the death rate from adverse events in this study was 0.5% of hospitalized patients. The study on the previous slide was 1%. So this is the sort of range we are in. One second, David. So in fact, between 44,000 and 100,000 Americans die each year due to medical errors inside and outside of hospitals. Medical errors are one of the top 10 killers in the United States, and they cost us between 17 and $29 billion every year. Yes, David. Uh, in the last slide, it was something like, didn't you say 33% of people in that study, there, there were adverse uh, events in 33? And so isn't like, wasn't 3.7 and 33 like very different? Uh, the definition of adverse events could have been different. So this might not have included, you know, patient falls or, or pressure ulcers or something else. So you're absolutely okay, right. yeah. These numbers are sort of all over the place and it depends on the tools you use and how you define it and blah, blah, blah. But the point is somewhere between half and 1% of hospitalized patients might die because of a medical mistake. And if you do the arithmetic, it's a top 10 killer. You know, what, the exact numbers are actually debated in the literature. And I gave you a, one study in particular, just to give you a flavor for it. But you're right to question the arithmetic. Now, the number of deaths, as I said, for medical errors would place medical error in the top 10 killers uh, somewhere in this range, right over here, you know, between below Alzheimer's disease, but, you know, above suicide, near diabetes, for example. And even on the low end of 44,000, more people die from medical errors than die from motor vehicle accidents. 43,000 Americans die from motor vehicle accidents in that year, or breast cancer, also 43,000, or AIDS, 17,000 people die of AIDS at least 44,000 for medical errors. And medical errors in iatrogenesis are not just about serious problems, however. They can also be about non-fatal problems. So right now we've been speaking about death, but there's even more harm that's caused not by fatal errors, but by non-fatal ones. Raise your hands. How many of you have had your wisdom teeth removed? About how many is it, Maggie, would you say? I can't see. Half of the class or? I think people forgot about the hand raising thing, or at least I did, and it's a good chunk. A good chunk. All right. Well, um, this is a slide that shows, you know, less severe medical harm, the burden of medical harm, millions of wisdom teeth pointlessly removed. I think I assigned this reading. I can't remember. Did I sign the reading? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Five million people per year have wisdom teeth removed at a cost of over $3 billion. There are 11 million days of productivity lost. 11,000 patients have permanent nerve damage as a result, and there's no evidence to justify this iatrogenic epidemic. Only 12% of cases may actually be justified. So in other words, most of you did not have to have your wisdom teeth removed. We socially constructed and economically incentivized the need for you guys to have your wisdom teeth removed, and like sheep, you didn't ask questions, you went to get your wisdom teeth removed. Doctor, doctor, why are you doing this? Where are the trials that show that wisdom teeth removal helps? 
the average oral surgeon in the USA, and there are about 5,000 of them, makes over 520,000 a year just from extracting wisdom teeth. And the practice that the uh, article I gave you concluded, the practice of prophylactic removal of wisdom teeth should be stopped. If you have younger siblings, tell them that 90% chance they do not need this procedure. Now, where do medical mistakes uh, originate? In the structure that surrounds the patient and the doctor, or in the agency of the doctor or the patient, as we mentioned earlier? And where does responsibility for errors lie? Within the system or with the doctor? And there's, an intent, there's a tension inherent in this topic between a kind of do no harm, which is in the Hippocratic Oath, it's something I swore when I became a doctor, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, which is a very fundamental principle in medicine, which we are all supposed to do. Don't make the patient worse, do no harm. And that's a rule of personal responsibility. I, as a doctor, am swear to try not to harm my patient. Or uh, there's a perspective of safety as a kind of system property. In other words, it's not what I'm doing, it's something about the healthcare system that might harm patients. Now, since some error is unavoidable in any human activity, and since error is intrinsic, that is to say, in the practice of medicine, there are going to be mistakes. Physicians need to cope with this existence of this error, both pragmatically, that is, they need to reduce it. We need to work as doctors to minimize error and, and personally to deal psychologically with its existence. It's devastating if you make a mistake that harms a patient. Let's start with a heartbreaking case outside of medicine as we consider this an error that warrants responsibility or blame or a change in the healthcare system. Every year there are cases like this as the spring arrives. Baby dies after dad forgot her in a car. A baby died after her father forgot to take her to daycare Friday morning, officials told KPRC Local 2. Houston police said the father discovered his mistake when he got to the daycare at Crawford Street near Rosedale Street in Southeast Houston Friday evening. He was there to pick up his seven month old daughter and her brother, who was taken to the facility separately. Houston Police Sergeant Robert Blaine said he forgot about dropping her off and instead went directly to work at Rice University and parked in the parking lot over there. He returned around 5 p.m. to his car. His child was dead in the back seat, drove back to pick up his son and his daughter at daycare, and upon arrival here at daycare, discovered the seven-month-old infant was in the back of the car. The girl was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Investigators said they believe she died from the heat. This was in March of March 15th of 2008. Police said taking the children to daycare separately was a change in routine for the family. The mother dropped off the, girl, the girl's brother separately because of swim practice. Detectives said they believe this was an accident as a Friday night, no charges had been filed and the investigation continued. Similar cases occur every year. You guys are gonna see cases like this and you'll email me in the coming months, I know it. And this was clearly an error. Now, what do you think caused this death? I'm gonna give you two choices. Do you think it was the dad's actions or do you think it was the drop-off system? So raise your hands if you think it was the dad's action. And Maggie, what fraction of the class is that approximately? A third to a half. About half think it was the dad's actions. And I'm gonna assume that the remaining half think it was the drop off system. Now imagine you are a surgeon and you have a change in routine. This is a prototypic kind of error that reason in the readings for today discusses, for which in principle, systems might be put in place to prevent. In other words, what kind of system might we want to prevent this example in, uh, of the kid dying in this car? Well, what could be such systems? Maybe uh, when the child is not delivered, all, all, all uh, uh, daycare centers would have to call both parents and say, by any chance, could you have left your kid in the car today? You know, we noticed your child wasn't delivered. 
So it's like a checklist. They'll just call every parent. Or maybe there could be a, a sensor in the back of the car that detects carbon dioxide. Um, this was this sensor like this was done uh, during uh, about 20 or 30 years ago. There were lots of goofs where doctors tried to intubate patients and put a tube in their lungs and occasionally would goof and put a tube in their esophagus. And in the surgery, they would be blowing air into the patient's stomach and it would look like their chest was being inflated because air was being blown into the stomach, but no air was going into the patient's lungs and the patients would die of hypoxia. So what they did is, is they added a little sensor where the air comes out to detect carbon dioxide, which only can come from your lungs, not your stomach. So if no carbon dioxide is coming out, they're like, whoa, the, the tube is not in the patient's lungs, it's in their stomach. Maybe we should have a law that says all cars should have a carbon dioxide detector in them and alarm when, uh, when they detect that there's a person breathing in the car. Remember, in fact, the suicide net at the Golden Gate Bridge that we discussed on the first day of lecture and the cost per life saved, which was about $270,000 per life saved. Maybe we should mandate such a procedures and we might wind up saving a certain number of children's lives every year and conclude that it was worth it. Now this, in fact, is the system's perspective on, uh, on, medical, um, on medical care. Hold on, where am I? System perspective, here we go. And this perspective says that the best people can make the worst errors. This is true. Even the best surgeon can make a mistake. Short-lived mental states, such as forgetfulness or inattention, are the last and least manageable part of the error sequence. People will always make errors and always commit violations of procedures. And blaming people for their errors will have no effect on their future fallibility, like the driver and the baby. That father did not intend to kill his child. That father feels awful about what happened in his child. He made a mistake. And so the question is, can we construct systems that help mitigate those types of mistakes in, those, in these types of situations? And so I'm going to talk more about this, but before I do, yes, Severin. I have a kind of a opposite question and in a certain degree, like, um, would you consider that there are a lot of systems in place in modern hospitalized that almost like incent, well, not incentivize, but directly provoke mistakes? Like kind of what I'm thinking about is that like, isn't it still that like residents can have 36 hour shifts? And I can't imagine that someone who's been doing something for 36 straight hours is particularly thinking about the small details. Well, I can say as someone who did that, you learn, I mean, yes, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely the case that your brain is not performing as well in the 36th hour as it was in the second hour. But you learn, you really learn to um, try to reduce that error proneness. Um, and we used to work, so there have been changes in the hours that are required and they should be, they should absolutely be implemented. Uh, and, and you're right in what you're saying, but nevertheless, what I would say is that there is some sense in which you can get used to it, especially if you're in your 20s and you're young. Uh, but um, but I, the other thing that was implicit in what you said is, is it the case that when we build systems that protect doctors from making mistakes, maybe the doctors become sloppier? And you may or may not know this, but for example, uh, it, there's some evidence that as we've made cars safer, like as we added airbags to vehicles, the fatality rate did not decline because people started driving more recklessly. They're like, oh, you know, now the car is a box of steel and there are, you know, there are airbags in them. So as we've kept making improvements, maybe people get a little bit sloppier. So if that's what you're asking, I don't, I haven't seen studies to that effect, but I suppose it's possible. Anyway, I'd like to turn to the problem of blame because a very influential report was released by the Institute of Medicine in 2000, trenchantly entitled To Air is Human. And it identified several ways to reduce medical harm. And one way was that healthcare organizations should implement non-punitive systems for reporting and analyzing errors. The Institute of Medicine and other official policymaking bodies and experts in medical error have championed the need for a blame-free culture in medicine with systems for detecting and reporting errors similar to other industries. 
And it is commonly argued that the best way to uncover and reduce error is to promote a culture where no blame is ascribed to individual actors. Moreover, in this paradigm, most errors are viewed largely as system-based, as impossible to eradicate completely, and as infrequently traceable to truly negligent actions. Blame is seen as doing more harm than good, as engendering feelings of inadequacy or fear of punishment, and as ultimately pushing analysis and recognition of mistakes underground and limiting opportunities for improvement. So the current thinking about the occurrence and prevention of errors focuses on this <laughs> system's perspective. I'm not sure I entirely agree with this, but let me tell you a little bit about it. This perspective says, look, healthcare is a complex system. Errors and harm result from multiple faults and diffuse breakdowns. Humans are just one part of the system and error is, is an intrinsic part of the system. And the argument in this perspective is that healthcare is a complex and technological industry that's prone to accidents. So let's start working to fix the system, pay attention to the structure around the agency of the doctors and the nurses. And in fact, when large systems fail, it is typically due to multiple faults that occur together. And this is the famous Swiss cheese model that was in your readings and that I also discussed in the setting of COVID uh, pandemic response a few lectures ago. Every step in a process has a potential for failure. And the ideal system is analogous to a stack of slices of Swiss cheese. You know, if you consider the holes as opportunities for a process to fail and each of the slices as defensive layers in the process, an error may allow a problem to pass through one layer or even in a second layer, but then a system will stop it from occurring. For a catastrophe to occur, all the holes need to line up and then the accident can occur when, each, when all the holes are perfectly lined up and the error cascade can occur. The more defenses you put up, the better. And also the fewer the holes and the smaller the holes, the more likely you are to catch and stop errors that might otherwise occur. One of the greatest contributors to accidents in any industry, including healthcare, is human error. However, saying that an accident is due to human error is not the same as assigning blame because most human errors are induced by systems failures, this perspective claims. Humans commit errors for a variety of known and complicated reasons. And these reasons are called latent errors or systems failures. And they are felt to pose the greatest threat to safety in a complex system because they lead to operator errors. They are failures built into the system and present long before the active error. It's the way the system is designed and we put the human being in this environment and they can't but help to make a mistake is the argument. A typical example of a latent error is the packaging of two different medications in the same kind of ampule. Who can blame a doctor or a nurse who accidentally administers the wrong medication in such a circumstance? And current responses to errors tend to focus on the active errors. But in many cases, this is not an effective way to make the system safer. Discovering and fixing latent errors is likely to have a greater effect on building safer systems than, than trying to stop doctors and nurses from making mistakes at the point at which they do. And so this is the idea that healthcare has to look at medical errors, not as a special case of medicine, but as a special case of error and to apply the theory and approaches already used in other fields to reduce errors and improve reliability. For example, in nuclear power or in airline travel, what do they do to minimize errors that we could learn from and apply in medicine, treating the problem as a systems problem, not as a problem of the human operating the nuclear power plant or the pilot necessarily driving uh, the plane. So the systems perspective believes that medical accidents are usually the result of complex systems failures. And although incompetent and malfeasant staff uh, can exist, and although incompetent and malfeasant staff can exist, um, Adverse outcomes are more commonly the result of systems problems. 
And the argument is that safety in medicine will not improve unless its complex systems are redesigned. So um, why can I not get to the next slide here? Let me just see what's going on here. Here we go. Now, two typical kinds of human fallibility are something known as post-completion error and miscompletion error. A post-completion error is omitting the final step in a process, like leaving an original document on a copying machine or sending an email without an attachment. I'm sure all of you have made this error of sending an e you're typing up the email, it's very important to the professor, and you fail to attach the exam. What, if you were a surgeon and you made that kind of mistake, you could kill the person, but it's a very human kind of mistake to make. A miscompletion error is different. It's like starting a drive and then taking a left instead of a right or going to school instead of work, perhaps because you heard a great song on Spotify. So you're going along to work and you hear a great song and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going over here. You get totally distracted and you, you wind up at the wrong place or you find yourself you know, at the location of your math class instead of your physics class, because you happen to bump into one of your friends from the math class and you walk absent, you're walking to physics, you bump into your friend from math class who you usually bump into on your way to math. And then you just walk with that person and you wind up at the wrong class. That's a miscompletion error. And you can easily imagine how, how doctors would make such mistakes. Here's another example. This is a reenactment of an event that took place at Ezra Stiles College. I won't say, who the person that did this was. So these are, you know, the famous tater tots that are available or were available in Yale dining halls. And what you need to do in this situation is you need to take a plate from here, put the plate on the tray. That's the first step. I'm sorry, the first step is put the tray on the counter. Second step is take a plate and put it on the tray. And the third step is take these tongs and put the tater tots on your uh, plate. But this is what the person did. They missed this middle step. They took the tongs and they put the tater tots directly on their tray. Okay, oops, that's a mistake. Maybe we should have a checklist pasted there. You know, dear Yaley, is the tray on the counter? Check. Is there a plate on the tray? Check. Are the tater tots on the plate or on the tray? Check, right? Or maybe we could redesign the system and pre-attach the plates to the trays. So that way we'll prevent this mistake. When you get your tray, already plates will be glued to the tray and that way you'll be able to avoid this mistake. You see the point, right? Like, can we change the system to prevent you from making these innocent mistakes? All of, all of you have made these kinds of mistakes. They just have more impact when you're a doctor. Now this movement regarding medical error has also pushed for changes in vocabulary and in thinking. So for example, we, we can think of human error or the root cause of a problem. Uh, or an investigation, or judgments, or blame, or isolated events, or punitive and retaliatory, or we could change the language. Instead of human error, we'll think of an accident or a failure. Instead of root cause, we'll think it's a multi-causal problem. Instead of an investigation, it's going to be analysis and study. Instead of judgment, it's learning. Instead of blame, it's accountable. Instead of an isolated event, it's a systems problem. And instead of punitive and retaliatory, it's blameless. And these vocabulary changes are also meant to suggest a new perspective and hence new ways of fixing the system. And incidentally, this is another example of the social construction we discussed earlier in the term. But here we are constructing our perspective on medical mishaps. We're changing how we see it. And this system's perspective has been proposed, has proposed various fail-safe devices and technical fixes, similar to the changes implemented in aviation safety, such as checklists and foolproof equipment design. And here are some suggestions to the parts of the system having to do with the administration of medications. So let's fix the problem of medical errors. Let's implement pharmacy computer systems. Let's have automated dispensing cabinets. Let's barcode drug selection. Let's barcode patient identification. So no more goofs. You have to scan the drug, scan the patient, and then you administer. You can have computer generated or electronic medication administration records or electronic drug information or checklist before you administer things. For example, there are many reasons for unclear medication orders 
the technological interventions, modifying the structure, circumventing the physician's agency might fix. One study found that 17% of physicians had illegible handwriting. Let's get them to type so that people acting on the physician's orders can read what the doctor wrote. For example, dispensing errors can be made because medication names are misinterpreted and not just illegible. There are hundreds of drugs with similar names that can be confused or interchanged. So quinine is not quinidine. Sulfasalazine is not sulfadiazine. Hydroxazine is not hydralazine. Losec is not Lasix. Clonopin is not clonidine. You guys don't know these drugs, but when I read these drugs, I'm like, this is ridiculously hilarious. These drugs are totally different and on and on. So, and giving the wrong medicine can actually harm patients quite a bit. And in fact, some brand name changes have caused such confusion, some brand names have caused such confusion and frequent errors that the manufacturers voluntarily change the brand names. For example, Losec, where's Losec? Is now called Prilosec instead of Losec because it was confused with Lasix so often. And whose fault is it when doctors or nurses use the wrong drug, even if the names are different, if the vials of the drugs are hard to distinguish and both types of vials are in the same drawer at the patient's bedside? Uh, you know, in, in intensive care unit settings or in, or in emergency room settings, there's a crash cart that'll have lots of drugs in little vials. You, you flip that little plastic lid off and you put a needle in a little rubber stopper that's at the top. Furosemide is a diuretic that makes you pee and midazolam is like Valium and it relieves your anxiety or puts you to sleep. <laughs> totally different drugs, but they look so similar. You can easily see a doctor making this kind of mistake. And in fact, you can make the same mistake. You go to the pharmacy, you go to the CVS, is this shampoo or conditioner? I mean, can you tell the difference? This is Garnier Fructis fortifying shampoo, and this is Garnier Fructis fortifying conditioner. Sleek and shine, Brazilian smooth, it all looks the same. What's the difference? One has the cap on the bottom, I guess, because conditioner is harder to squeeze out, and one has the cap on the top. Who could blame you if you put conditioner in your hair instead of shampoo? Or here's another reenactment that can happen to anyone, not just doctors. My brother was visiting me. Uh, this was a couple of years ago now. And he left his toiletries in my bathroom. And I wanted to borrow his shaving cream. I went in to shave. And so I was going to grab his cream to shave. Or at least I thought it was his shaving cream. But actually, it was not. If you look at these two products, they're very different. One is Edge Shaving Cream, which gives you, for sensitive skin, and gives you ultimate closeness and ultimate comfort. And the other is Lautrimin, clinically proven to cure athlete's foot, which relieves itching, burning, cracking, and scaling. But they're both on, you know, I was just going into my kitchen, my bathroom, and picking up the orange can because it's time to shave. And I spray myself with, with you know, with foot fungus <laughs> powder instead of shaving cream, okay? It's an innocent mistake. It's obvious why that happened. You know, was that my fault? There never had been foot powder in my bathroom before, but my brother was visiting and left the product on my sink. This happens, okay, all the time. Uh, and, um, and there's no doubt that such changes in systems improvements are actually effective. Here are some results from one old study involving computerized order entry. When you force doctors to type in their orders, serious medication errors were reduced by 55%, prescribing errors by 19%, transcription errors by 84%, dispensing errors, administration errors, preventable adverse drug uh, uh, reactions or ADEs, I forgot what the E stands for, 17%, and so on. So just forcing, changing the system reduced the doctor's probability of making uh, mistakes. And indeed, hospitals can do better when they are forced to do better. To ensure compliance with high standards of care, uh, you guys probably don't know this, but every year, um, the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Hospitals performs unannounced on-site inspections at hospitals every 18 to 36 months. And during these week-long inspections, surveyors closely observe a broad range of hospital operations, focusing on high-priority patient safety areas including infection control and medication management. And the stakes for performance during this survey are very high. 
if you lose your accreditation or have a citation in the review process, it really damages the hospital's reputation. And so hospital staff are keenly aware that their behavior is being observed when the surveyors are there. This study sample included 244,787 admissions during survey and 150,000 admissions during non-survey weeks of patients that were otherwise similar and, the, and took into account the reasons for admission and, and, uh, and so on. And it looks at 30-day mortality when you compare patients admitted with a similar condition, if they're admitted when the surveyors are there compared to patients, otherwise similar patients admitted when the, patient, when the surveyors were not there. And lo and behold, it finds a dramatic reduction in mortality if you're admitted when the surveyors are there looking over the doctors and the nurses' uh, shoulders. So that's a big effect of people upping their game uh, during the period. If, doc if doctors and nurses could practice this way year round, we would have thousands of patients' lives per year would be saved. And there are other structural threats to patient safety too, such as the unavoidable annual rotation of house staff. Every year in July, uh, medical students graduate, they become interns, they suddenly have awesome power. Previously, they were just <laughs> medical students. Now, all of a sudden, they're doctors. I remember the first week I was a an intern, I wrote an order to administer a medicine to a pa in a patient's chart and the nurse, the nurse administered it. And I was like, wait a minute, don't you need to check with someone else? And she said, no, she did what I told her to do. It was really scary and really made me feel responsible and you know, to up my game and trouble and triple check. Now that what I was, because when you're a medical student, you write orders, nobody listens to you. The doctor has to, a real doctor has to check your orders before they're done. Anyway, every July, medical students become interns. Interns now become junior residents. Junior residents become senior residents. During July, everyone is the least experienced they can be for their grade. And this annual house staff turnover results in increased resource utilization. Doctors like order more tests because they're worried and decreased quality of care, including uh, eight risk adjusted mortality rates. So this shows, this is known as the July phenomenon. And, um, and this shows the average length of stay in days, which has this little blip up, but never mind that. And this shows the average mortality rate. So what's happening here is there's a seasonal variation in mortality. There's more, more, more hospitalized patients die in the winter than in the summer. It's a little parabola that's coming down. This is what would have happened if you had regular doctors practicing, you would have had this smooth parabola, but you get this little upward deflection, that little upward deflection right there because you have inexperienced doctors uh, taking care of patients. Major teaching facilities uh, show, show evidence of a July phenomenon with respect to mortality. And the adjusted magnitude of this effect is 0.122 percentage points. And the magnitude of this July phenomena represents a 4.3% increase relative to the average mortality rate of 2.82% for major teaching hospitals. You can detect a rise in death because the doctors are inexperienced. Or to put it another way, perhaps as many as one out of a thousand hospital patients in July die merely because of the newness of the interns. And to put that figure in perspective, that's roughly your risk of death in the next year. So that risk of death that you guys face in the next year, young people in their 20s, that's the risk of death that's imposed on every hospitalized patient simply, be, simply because they're being cared for by everyone at the least experience level they have for that year. And medical errors, and in particular medication areas, errors seem to be an especially prominent part of the July phenomenon because inside medical institutions, medica fatal medication errors spike in July and in no other month. And this July spike appeared only in counties containing teaching hospitals. This shows the month of death. And this is the ratio of the observed to expected numbers of deaths. And what you can see is that the ratio of observed to expected numbers, expected deaths for inpatient medication errors by month in the United States, you get this big spike in July when people are goofing up and giving the wrong uh, medications. And finally, there's another way uh, actually, I'm going to stop there for a moment and see if there are any questions. I can't see you, so I, but if you raise your hands, you appear all of a sudden. So if you have any questions, and then I'll wrap up with uh, 
another set of ideas taken from Illich. All right, because there's another way that medical care can be harmful beyond one-on-one -on -one effects, on, beyond the one-on-one -on -one effects on the bodies of individual patients that we've been considering. So, um, so there, there are different types of iatrogenesis is what Illich is arguing. There's individual harm. That's like when we goof and hurt a patient's body. And there's collective harm, which is what Illich is really concerned about the most which is the way in which the existence of medicine changes our society. And in fact, medical care can impose a kind of collective harm. And this is one conceptualization of what Illich means by social iatrogenesis. And a straightforward example of this is the creation of drug resistant pathogens that can spread in human populations. So once we start using, uh, using antibiotics, especially if we use them incompetently, we create the environment for new and dangerous germs to evolve, which is a generalized social harm, not necessarily a harm to a specific individual. And uh, so this shows hospital stays uh, with methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Methicillin is a very powerful penicillin type antibiotic. And it shows that you know the total number of discharges for this type of serious infection have been rising dramatically over a 25 year period. Uh, as we have thoughtlessly been using this, uh, this, uh, these types of medications. In fact, the careless prescribing of antibiotics has contributed to the emergence of many resistant pathogens. Me uh, method, uh, so multi-drug resistant TB, uh, drug resistant HIV, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, so-called VREC, and on and on. And this carelessness occurs at the societal institutional level in terms of drug policy, at the doctor level, in terms of prescription behavior, and at the patient level, in terms of drug seeking. Everyone is at fault for this. We have bad drug policies that make it easy for doctors to prescribe medications poorly. Doctors, when patients come in and, and they, expect a med they expect a prescription and the doctor knows that actually they should not give a prescription for viral infection. Giving an antibiotic for viral infection isn't gonna help the patient but the patient kind of wants a prescription and the doctor's used to feeling like, I need to feel like I'm doing something. Why don't I give the patient a useless medication? So the doctors prescribe these medications which affect the environment or patients. Patients feel ripped off if the doctor doesn't give them a prescription, but they shouldn't. The patients should say, I went to see the doctor. The doctor told me I have a viral illness or I do not have a bacterial illness or in any case, the benefits of the antibiotics do not exceed the risks. I shouldn't get it. They should accept that. Uh, and so I should note that these numbers have come down a little bit since then. Uh, and the CDC estimates that as many as 2 million nosocomial infections from all pathogens are acquired in hospitals each year, resulting in 90,000 deaths. In other words, infections that arise because you come into a hospital and get a nasty germ such as these kill 90,000 people a year. So in fact, nosocomial infections alone would be in the top 10 causes of death. And amazingly enough, Alexander Fleming, the, code, the discoverer of penicillin antibiotics anticipated this. This is his prescient warning when he was given the Nobel Prize in 1945. He wrote, remember he had just discovered it like a few years earlier and already is thinking ahead. He goes, the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. Here is a hypothetical illustration. Mr. X has a sore throat. He buys some penicillin and gives himself not enough to kill the streptococci, but enough to educate them to resist penicillin. He then infects his wife. As the streptococci are now resistant to penicillin, the treatment fails. Mrs. X dies. Who is primarily responsible for Mrs. X's death. Unbelievable, unbelievable that Fleming thought this way and spoke this way so far ahead of time. But Illich makes an even broader and more subtle argument. He means something different and broader by social iatrogenesis. 
and his critique of medicine is strident and compelling. He's, he's, when he's talking about it, when he says clinical iatrogenesis, doctors are affecting individual bodies. But in social iatrogenesis, doctors are affecting collectivities. Social iatrogenesis is over-medicalization. It is, Illich argues, the expropriation of health. Doctors take health away from society, take health away from individuals. It occurs when people are encouraged to use doctors for more and more trivial problems, as we saw in the social construction lecture a while back. And it captures the tendency of, of medicine to damage health, not via individual bodies, but by affecting the total social milieu. Illich goes on later, I don't think I assigned this part of the book, to describe something he calls cultural iatrogenesis, which destroys the human ability to deal with human weaknesses. People become distanced from their lives, from their humanity, Illich argues. Here, medical interventions interfere with the authentic experience of our bodies, with, our, with the authentic experience of suffering, with the authentic experience of birth, and with the authentic experience of death. What Illich is arguing is that medicine as a system alienates us from the, our humanity. It's a deep and subtle and hard argument. And I don't know how much I agree with it. It's compelling, but at the same time, I struggle with it. Illich is concerned with the adverse impacts of the social construction of disease. He is concerned with the ways in which the definition of a condition as a disease causes harm. What does it mean when the doctor detects a disease that the patient does not? What does it mean when the patient detects a disease that the doctor does not? What are the consequences for individuals and for society of labeling patients with diagnoses? And writing in 1976, he anticipated and was very critical of the system's perspective on medical error. This is what Illich writes. He writes, with the transformation of the doctor from an artisan exercising a skill on personally known individuals into a technician applying scientific rules to classes of patients, malpractice acquired an anonymous, almost respectable status. What had formerly been considered an abuse of confidence and a moral fault can now be rationalized into the occasional breakdown of equipment and operators. In a complex technological hospital, negligence becomes random human error or system breakdown. Callousness becomes scientific detachment and incompetence becomes a lack of specialized equipment. The depersonalization of diagnosis and therapy has changed malpractice from an ethical into a technical problem. You see reason and Illich are in conflict. Illich has one totally different perspective on the systems theory that, that reason and others do. And the question is once again, what are we to do with this? How are we to actually, because what I care about is minimizing deaths, right? Making the system function best. So I want the perspective that allows that to appear because it seems as if there's plenty of blame and responsibility to go around on all levels. And ironically, one of the reasons that doctors often are willing to embrace blame, in fact, one of the reasons that doctors often do not, do not want to displace all agency onto a systems perspective is that they want the credit. They want the credit for healing patients. And so you see, if you, if you say, ah, if there's a mistake, if the patient suffers, that's just a systems problem, then what are you to say about if you miraculously cure the patient? When you're a doctor, you want to believe, I have believed that it was I who made a difference. It was I, not the hospital system who saved the patient's life. And therefore, if I believe that, I also must believe that I can take the blame, not the system when things go wrong. Okay, thank you. 
Any questions before I let you go? A student messaged me a question, if you have a second. Okay. Uh, they said, as society progresses, there's an increase in the amount of people who are aware of disease and also an increase in the people who are vulnerable to a given disease emigrating to areas where the disease is endemic. Thus, my question is, how do we account statistically for the rise in the crude amount of medical errors that result from sampling a larger population? In other words, how do we know that the rise in iatrogenesis is attributed specifically to the medical system and not to an increase in medical awareness and thus hospital attendance or immigration? Those are all possibilities. So you're absolutely right. Now, as we, as we increase our surveillance, we may find more errors. So there may not be as, a, as known to God a true in, as known to God figuratively, a true increase in errors. It's just that we're detecting more of them. So if that's what your question is, then yes, that's possible. Uh, but in fact, but my argument was not that was not that there's been a rise and rise and rise in medical error. Uh, my argument is just that there's too much of it already. It's a top 10 killer. And the question is, how do we reduce that? Uh, and there's this tension between structure and agency, right? Is it like a systems perspective? We need to change all the things that I showed you about, or do we need to up the ante on doctors feeling responsible or both? And, 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 and how are these different perspectives felt by the doctors themselves? Any other questions before I let you go? Okay, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.